Hello and welcome. In many ways, we in India are on the edge of most uncertain times in the global economy. In 2015, what will happen? Will oil prices fall further or are they about to shoot up again? Is the global economy on the brink of another recession? Or is the revival of the US economy going to boost world growth? Is inflation going to carry on falling or are prices going to go back up again next year and hit your wallet? In the midst of all these uncertainties, the focus of the world is now on India and the new government. Will India overtake China's growth rate and become the destination for international capital flows this year and from now on? Where is our stock market heading? Has it peaked or is there room for it to go even higher? Amongst all this clutter and uncertainty, in this show, we look at what are the top 10 trends that will define 2015. 10 big things you should look out for or even watch out for. Fortunately, to answer these questions, I don't have to answer them. I have one, with me one of the finest minds in the world financial stage, Ruchir Sharma. Writer, author, and one of the largest investors in emerging markets, controlling billions of dollars. I know you hate me saying that. But I wouldn't like to be in your position at a time like this. It is, or is it a good time to be an investor? Because the uncertainty, is it really much more than normal this year? Well, I think so, because I think uh, that the global economy is really weak. It's running on just one engine currently, which is the U.S. economy. Right. At the same time, in India, I think what's happened is that we've been very inward focused over the last year because of the elections and all the sort of expectations right. of a new government. Yet, the ground reality is the fact that the Indian economy's fortunes are heavily tied to what's mm -hmm. happening in the global economy. And that's a trend I think we systematically underappreciate. And I think we that... We think we're unique and everything <laughs> happens by things we do. But global impact on our... The global economy's impact on us is enormous. Exactly. It's like enormous, systematically underappreciated, even though the trends show that right. the effect is huge. So I think that's really what's going to matter for the Indian economy a lot this year. And I suspect that the conversation is going to shift from this very outward focus um, return, I think, this year, from the very inward focus that of the had. past year. Right. But obviously a huge event happened last year. We had elections, a change in government, a new leader. And you've done a lot of research into over the decades when a new leader comes in, how do the stock markets react, how do the world react. Let's have a look at uh, some of the findings of your research. Basically, it shows that in election year, year one, is a year of hope. And the stock markets, on average, go up 20%. Whoever the new leader is, when a new leader comes in, not a re-elected leader. Yes. Then, that's the year of hope, you say, right? Yes. Your research. Right. Year two is reality. If the new leader does become a reformer, introduces reforms, it goes up another 20%. But that's the make or break year. If he doesn't live up to hope, then it goes down to 12%. If he's a non-reformer, it goes down negative 12%. So, year one, We've been, in fact, a little better than the 20%. We're about 30% up this year. Yes. But the make or break is about to happen. That's right. Because in dollar terms, you know, uh, our returns have been about 25% or so over the past 25. year, okay. which is sort of in line with the, with the average. Yeah, you know, yeah, there, yeah. there are a whole bunch of cases that we looked at here. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating is that in the second year, there's a divergence which takes right, place, right. which is that if the uh, new leader who comes to power does deliver, then the party goes on. Otherwise, you get a pretty sharp ending to it. And in recent instances, we have seen that. In Mexico, in Japan, you had new leaders who came. First year, all good. And in dollar terms, everything sort of does very well. In the second year, you begin to get a big retreat. And historically, this goes back to the days of Yelston in Russia being a failure, Estrada in Philippines. And then you have success stories like Lula in Brazil. And even initially, the likes of Putin, the likes of Erdogan when they came to power, a uh, lot of hope and expectations, and they did deliver in the second year. And that's what led to um, their markets and the economy doing much better for many years. It's an amazing pattern, years. actually, that over all these different countries, first year, they're all about the same because everybody hopes the new leader is going to do something. But uh, second year separates the men from the boys, the reformers from the non-reformers. Yes, absolutely. Wow. That's the case. So in that case, what we are about to see is the second year coming on. Right. Uh, 
and there's some big events going to happen, and you've been saying focus on February. Right. You know, fasten your seatbelts in February because there are three sort of big events, I think, lined up right. for India in uh, Feb. Okay, let's have a look at the three of them. Yeah. One, of course, is the budget. Yes, and, and, and more so now because the Prime Minister has been speaking a lot about how he wants this to be a transformational budget. Right. And the first budget wasn't received that well, but I think a lot of people sort of give it the benefit of time. Saying that it was, was too early. early. Yeah. It was too early, right. but now you've sort of, uh, you'll have the government in power for many months, and right. the talk has been of a transformational budget, so the expectations have also been built up, and so this should be that high threshold or begin transformation budget. You said three things in February. Right. Fasten your seatbelt for three things. Yes. So apart from being a second year, it's also make or break month. What's <laughs> the, what is the second thing? Right. I think that you know, this is something which has not been discussed so far, surprisingly, which is that the Finance Commission uh, will probably table its report in Parliament uh, in February. And from what I gather, some pretty radical suggestions have been made here about devolution of power to the states. And this is something which I really believe in, which is that it's very hard to sit in Delhi and control the destiny of India. Right. And that's where, you know, that's when India has done poorly back in the 1970s uh, well, It's all so. centralized it's and all, all central decision making. Exactly. Not that the states always do it right, but right. the odds are higher, higher that better things happen when the decision making is left to the states, particularly about what to spend on, what schemes and on. This is actually just sort of divert to your other interest elections. Right. It happens, happens in elections as well. A lot of state leaders are coming up right. uh, instead of just everybody voting for some great central leader. That was a change this year. So this will be a test. When Mr. Modi was chief minister, he was very firm on devolution, yes. on a federal system. Now as prime minister, will he push for that as well? Exactly, because uh, I'm sure he'll be surrounded by a lot of people who will you know, like, tell him that you can't let go of so much power uh, to the states. Right. Uh, you know, and, uh, and they'll play up to this sort of thing that you've got to control yeah. much more from the, uh, from the center. That's the typical story which happens. So this is where he really have to sort of show his hand. That is he willing to be true uh, to his instincts as the chief minister or has he changed now that he's moved to the center? He's been talking about cooperative, competitive federalism. Right. And talking about giving much more power to the states. Mm -hmm. But so February we will see how that actually gets translated into practice, that's how much right. That's right, because he, I think he should embrace this Finance Commission report and, and uh, use that as a lead for changing this uh, balance of power much more in favor of the states. It's already been shifting, but I think this would really move much more power to give the states much more power to spend uh, and possibly even tax. And the third factor to watch out for in February? is uh, the monetary policy decision, which is that I think a lot of expectations are building up given the collapse in inflation, uh, both here in India and globally, uh, that the Reserve Bank of India will finally begin its interest rate easing cycle. Uh, so there's a meeting in early February, and of course, there's the budget. And I think that there have been some hints that the decision may be tied to the budget as well, that if the budget follows the path of uh, so-called fiscal consolidation, then it would give them much more uh, ammunition to go out there and start cutting interest rates. So these are three things to watch for in the month of February. But it's quite possible that given the collapse in inflation, the decline in interest rates uh, may well begin in February. So you think February, what's the probability of interest rates coming down? Well, it's hard to sort of call it one month, but I mean, I think as, as we will see that given the fact that we are uh, on the brink of a global recession possibly, and the fact that inflation is collapsing Around globally, world, yeah. I think those trends is something which will probably dictate much lower interest rates in India as well. Let's see what Adi Godridge, the chairman of the Godridge Group, had to say about that. One, there must be clear announcements on ease of doing business. Two, there must be clear incentives for increased manufacturing. And as I mentioned, the minimum alternate tax should be reduced to about 8 to 10 percent. The government scope for disinvestment is very large. They will, they'll have a full year in the next financial year to plan these disinvestments. So both meeting a tight fiscal deficit target and incentivizing the economy can be done together. So it's key now, February, and we're already in 2015. Of course, the financial year will start in, in India in April. Right. We're really on the brink of make or break for India now. Well, in a way, I mean, you know, right. like, uh, I know these things sort of, 
never quite work up, out yes. that way, yeah. but, but but I think that the focus will be intense. It's in more, more significant a, than most years. Exactly. I think there'll be a lot of market volatility as well to uh, go hand in hand with that. Well, we've got 10 big things coming this year, 10 big trends we should look out for. Let's have a look at the third big trend that we should look out for. Will there be a global recession? What's the global recession watch telling us? Look at that since 1981. Ruchir, if you could run us through that. We've seen first in 81, the anti-inflation squeeze around the world and that caused a recession. Then the Iraq war and oil prices shooting up, that caused a recession. Uh, then the dot-com bust around 2001 caused a recession. And of course, the great financial crisis in 2008. It happens quite regularly. So what's happening now is that in 2014, the rece recession is under 2% growth globally. Right. I think this is one of those things, you know, that a lot of people are taken aback by this, which yeah. is that the common perception is that you need negative growth. In two you consecutive know, quarters, et cetera. Exactly, yes. but that's a bit of a myth. What we see here is that in countries like China, let's say, right. a growth rate of 4 to 5% is defined as a recession. Like in India's case, if growth rate is 3 to 4%, that would feel like a because recession. Because it drops from 8 to 3 or 9 to 5, 6 in China, and that seems a big slowdown. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So globally, a growth rate of less than 2% is generally defined as a recession. Right. And as you can see here, in the past 35 years, we've had four such instances. Right. And the problem currently is this, that the global growth is currently running at about 2.5% or so. Just above. Exactly. So that's just above uh, the level for a global recession. And if something sort of tips this over, you really have a global recession uh, in 2015. I just want to go back to this 2% IMF norm for a global recession. Right. Does it imply that India and China and some of the now becoming bigger economies anyway grow at 4 to 5%? So to average 2, the West really has to go almost into negative. That's right. You know, like, or it could be even China. I think as we will see that the big risk to the global economy, I think, currently is China. Because right. China has gone from being a marginal player in the global economy 20 years ago right. to now being the leading contributor of global growth. That is an amazing uh, statistic. Just, have a, uh, just run us through this graphic. The key here is that in 1994, United States contributed 33% to world growth and is now dropped to contributing only 20%. But China in 1994, that economy, contributed to world growth only 8%. And it shot up to where USA used to be. So it's, as you were saying, the largest single contributor to world growth. So if China slows down, that huge contribution gets impacted. Right, and that's already happening because the Chinese economy, from a pace of about 10% economic growth in right. 2010, right. has slowed down to a pace of possibly below 7% just now. Right. And that's already causing a lot of uh, yeah, because negative that's sentiment. down 3% and you're one-third, so you're hitting global growth by 1% anyway. Anyway, that's Global right. growth. That's right, and it's still falling which is that, and I suspect that, the, uh, that given the massive debt buildup in China, that the growth rate is likely to keep falling in China, possibly to 4 to 5 percent over the next couple of right. years or so. So that's cutting another 2 percent of the global growth rate because it's a 33 percent contributor. My God, that's huge. That's right. Uh, How big is the, is the debt in China? In terms of, there's been a huge increase in China in the debt level. Just to put it very simply, that... Uh, about five years ago, it took just over a dollar of debt to create a dollar of economic growth in China. Now, over the past year or so, it's taken nearly four dollars of debt to create a what? dollar of economic growth in China. So there's a huge buildup in Chinese debt. It's gone up from about 150% of GDP to about 240% of GDP over the last six to seven years. Wow. And that's really weighing down the because Chinese economy. you can't keep building up debt and you have to, uh, your headroom... You run out of headroom after a while. That's right. And I find this really fascinating that we have looked at a lot of research that is there any way that you can predict an economic slowdown or predict a major financial crisis? And the only factor which has consistently predicted economic slowdowns and uh, financial crises and economic crises is when a country racks up too much debt over a short period of time. Right. That's right. what happened in U.S. and Europe before the 2008 financial crisis. And that's exactly what China has done in the last five years. They're in a slow global economy. It's tried to keep growing at a, its own target. And 
uh, accumulated massive Too amounts of debt, debt right. in doing that. Now, we've been talking about America, China. What about Europe? Everybody keeps focusing on Europe, the Greeks, Greece problem in Greece, Germany, America, I mean, uh, France and England slowing down. But according to your figures, it shows that Europe actually is not that important, not that relevant. So perhaps too much focus on it. We've seen, according to your data, Europe used to contribute in 1994, not long ago, 25% of world growth. Now it's down to 10% of world growth. I mean, that's just one third of China. Exactly. So you know, therefore, I find that you know that's something which is that risk is overestimated. Now, it's, now of course, if Europe has a crisis or some country gets thrown out of the euro, that could cause some sort of financial contagion. But right. from an economic growth perspective, Europe has really become a marginal player. The UK is doing well, in fact, outside that. But within Europe, the large economies of France and Italy, they're really stagnating. And I think that that is the real problem for the global economy, that currently you have Europe, which is doing very poorly. You have China, which is slowing down considerably. And the US is still doing OK. But as, your, as the graph showed, that the US is not that powerful an engine as it used to be 20 years ago to lift right. the global economy on its own. So given that China is slowing down, Europe is slowing down, America speeding up but not such a great contributor, what about India? Can India grow fast this year in 2015? We, you know, I think this is one of those uh, points that, you, that we made at the outset, yeah. that we tend to live in our own bubble and not focus enough about what's happening around the world and how it's impacting us. But I find this graph really fascinating, which is that if you go back to 1980, Right. and take any five-year period in India's uh, economic history since then, right. what you find is that India's growth rate over those five years is extremely linked to what's happening to other emerging markets. So that's the, uh, the orange line is the emerging market growth rate over right. the last uh, 25 years. 35 and years, yes. Just above it, 35 years, and just above it is the India growth. It's always between 1% and 2% above the average. That's it's right. It's like we're not doing our own thing. We're just being bumped up or uh, dropped. With the, it's like we're on a, a boat in, a, in waves. Right? That's right, exactly. Uh, and I think that uh, the reason India is able to grow somewhat faster than other emerging markets is because our base is much lower. Our per capita income is only about $1,500 compared to the per capita income on em in emerging markets of close to $10,000. But this is really a fascinating point to me, which is that yeah. there's never been a period in India's economic history where India's growth rate has been one to two percentage points uh, off or faster that is than the emerging market amazing. average. And this was true even last decade. This was true even after the reforms of 1991, which were carried out. So these global linkages are incredible. And what that really implies is that for India to grow at above 6% right. over the next five years, right. something dramatic panting. needs to happen. If we want to, to be like spread. China, because China didn't follow this. There was a big spread between emerging markets and China's growth rate. Well, of course. Because so China's if we want to do that, there has to be something totally out of the box, something we haven't done before. That's right, something we, which we have never done before. And this is when I find that the sort of discussion gets a bit uh, misguided when people speak about returning to last decade's growth rate, as right. if that was really Good our point. natural yeah. growth rate. But everybody rate. was growing That's fast right. at that exactly. time. Exactly, everybody right. was, you know, was, you know, was growing fast. And now, now we had a global slowdown, and India slowed down too. But I think that the key thing here is that if India wants to grow at a pace of more than, let's say, 6%, because I don't think the average growth rate of emerging markets over the next five years is going to be any faster than 4%. That's been so the historical average. Everybody, emerging markets about 4%. That's right. So if India to go above 6, it has to break the norm. Break the norm, which it has never done right. in its entire economic history, going back to at least uh, post-independence right. history. Right. Uh, and since 1980, we have the data here, even after 1991, India has never done that. So I think that for India to do that, you really have to bet on something truly exceptional happening here as far as pr um, productivity enhancing reforms are concerned. So we asked Sajid Chenoy, the chief India economist at JP Morgan, what he thinks about the growth rate in India and the rest of the world. This is what he had to say. I think people forget that when India was growing at 8 or 9 percent in the mid-2000s, it was in the back of the global economy uh, growing at 4 percent, and there was a lot of liquidity sloshing around. Now the global economy is slated to grow at, you know, 2.5 percent or thereabouts. If we try and overreach and, and stimulate the economy too much, we'll go back backwards and, uh, you know, stoke macroeconomic instability. I would think in the current environment, uh, 6 percent growth over the next uh, two years uh, is, is what India can do and what policymakers should uh, attempt to focus on. So 
he's trying to say don't even try to go at 8 or 9% because if the rest of the world is going at 4% emerging markets, then that 4% gap between India and the rest of emerging markets may be too much to achieve. Do you agree with that? Or there are certain things we can do no, I think to the hit point 8 or 9%? Don't try and use uh, stimulus. Artificial exactly. stimulus. Exactly. Artificial yeah. stimulus, thinking that that's the target you have to reach in such a right. weak environment. Now, if over five years you carry out some major productivity enhancing reforms, like China did in the 1990s, right. and you're able to get the growth rate way above the emerging market average, that's fantastic. But do not expect that to be the natural line that you have to hit. Because I think that the 7 to 8% talk, that you know, like India needs to return to its growth rate of 7 to 8% or 8 to 9%, that really was something which was caused by global factors. Right. And now the global economy is weak at about 2.5% or so, and the emerging market mm -hmm. average is back four. to 4%. And this environment to grow above 6% is going to be extremely really difficult. Tough. I remember interviewing Lee Kuan Yew, and he said, well, in India, if it wants to grow like China, has to do a lot of new things. Because when China did it, the highway was more or less empty. Now the highway is packed. So right. you can't just replicate China, because you've got to do something totally different. You have to build another highway. That's right. You know, the, these economic models keep changing. changing. You know, in terms of what worked in the 1950s and 60s, and then what worked for China in the 1990s may not work for uh, India currently. Well, one small thing, China now has a much higher base. That's We're right. talking about $7,500, we are about $1,500. So for us to grow at 8% or 9% on a $1,500 base, a little easier? Absolutely, because I think that uh, once a country becomes a middle-income country like China has become, then Tougher there's no and, way yeah. that, you know, like it's like a sprinter, that you know, once you sort of reach middle age, it's very difficult to sprint uh, very rapidly, then it's right. about maintaining yourself. I mean, when you're young, you can sprint rapidly. So like India has the potential to sprint, but the fact is that it has never really sprinted on its own so far. So you're saying China's middle age, bit of a beer belly, <laughs> love handles, that's what's happening? Can't well, I sprint? Think given the excessive debt, yeah, I think more <laughs> okay. than that. <laughs>